Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. Is it okay, or do I do I sound like weird again? I'm hearing distorted. Better now? Okay. I sound fine. Okay, good. Sorry, it's just I've been having some difficulties with the mic, like it's not syncing. So I just wanted to make sure that it sounds okay right now. Okay, good. All right. Well, happy Friday, everybody. Um, thank you so much for being here. Another Friday, another journey, another another hour with me. Um, today we're going to be talking about pregnant healthcare workers. And it's going to be fabulous. Okay, let's me make sure this thing is advancing. Okay, I think it's working. Okay, so today we're going to go over chapter 104, pregnant healthcare personnel, uh, as well as just briefly at the end, we're going to do isolation precautions and specimen collection and transport, uh, a quick review. Okay, so first recommendation for today is going to be the podcast, This Week in Virology. I don't know how many of you um, listen to podcasts regularly, but I really, really enjoy this podcast. I think it's really great, especially some of their more recent um, stuff has been really good. So in case you have a iPhone, Spotify, however you get your podcasts, just please be sure to check them out. Um, there's never been a better time <laughs> to listen to a virology podcast than in the middle of a pandemic. Um, okay, another thing, please make sure you check your inbox for those of you who are APIC members and who are working in infection prevention. So APIC has sent out a survey, and this survey is essentially focusing on IPs and our work. So this is what it says. To help APIC continue to advocate for much needed IPC resources during COVID-19 and to better understand current IPC protocols and the concerns of infection preventionists, the APIC COVID-19 task force is asking IPs to complete a brief survey. We know IPs are stretched to the limit as we face seasonal flu and COVID-19, so we don't take this request lightly. Your response will provide APIC with the intelligence required to speak with policymakers and the media and also add to the scientific literature documenting the IPIC IP experience during COVID-19. Regardless of whether you are able to complete the survey, we thank you for your work to keep patients and healthcare workers safe during 2020. The survey closes on Thursday, October 29th. So it's closing next week. We need to make sure that we get as many um, responses in. I recently listened to a podcast. So um, APIC has, I think it's called the Five Second Podcast. And um, most recently they did one on COVID-19 and, and the effect that it's had on IPs. But before that, there was a podcast with um, Sarah Smathers and she was talking about policy and advocacy within, within the field of infection prevention. So when we get these types of messages and these types of emails, it's really important to not ignore them. We need to make sure that we're responding and that we're giving our input on these surveys um, so that, so that other IPs and APIC and other professional agencies can advocate for us for our field. Um, I did email APIC to, to see if I can send out this link to, to everybody. I'm not sure if it's specific to me. Um, they haven't responded, but I will be sending this out if they don't respond. Um, <laughs> so I hope they respond soon because um, I want to make sure IPs can answer it. All right. Moving on, so let's go ahead and start with some key concepts. You guys can still hear me okay, right? I don't sound like I'm in a tube. I sound fine. All good, okay, perfect. Okay, key concepts. So, consistent adherence of pregnant healthcare personnel to the practices of standard precautions, especially hand hygiene, will protect against most exposures to infectious agents of concern during pregnancy. Following standard precautions, that is considering all body fluids except sweat potentially infectious and use personal protective equipment when exposure to blood or body fluids is anticipated. So when you click on the CDC website, they're gonna go over uh, standard precautions and what that is. There are seven components to standard precautions per CDC. Number one, number one is hand hygiene. We know the importance of hand hygiene is the number one way to reduce healthcare associated infections, exposures, et cetera. 
So hand hygiene is going to be number one. Number two is the use of personal protective equipment, gloves, masks, and eyewear, depending on the type of contact that you're anticipating to have with the patient. Then it's respiratory hygiene and cough etiquette. So all these three have been so, um, so vital during this pandemic. And, you know, one of the things that I think still holds true. So when you're investigating an outbreak, when you're looking at um, pandemics, when you're looking at cases of whatever whatever it may be, norovirus, influenza on in your facility, I think one of the things that is always relevant is your bread and butter of infection prevention. And what is the bread and butter of infection prevention? The very basics, following standard precautions, hand hygiene and PPE. That is, so that continues to be some of our biggest issues within healthcare. Um, and I think we need to continue to place an emphasis on competency-based training and on access to education for our staff. We need to advocate for staff and we need to push for that. Um, there's gonna be a lot of rearranging of budgets and um, we need to we need to be involved in those conversations, especially surrounding education, um, because it's important. So four is sharps and safety, engineering and work practice controls. Five is safe injection practices, so aseptic technique for parental medications. Safe injection practices does have a ton of different components, so it's um it's not only focusing on aseptic technique. Um, but we're not going to dive into that. Sterile instruments and devices, and then clean and disinfected environmental surfaces. So those are all of our standard precautions per CDC. The last key concept is for practical purposes, immunologic function is normal during pregnancy and otherwise healthy woman is not considered to be an immunocompromised host. There is some decrease in cell-mediated immunity in the third trimester to viruses and pathogenic fungi. So the very this slide basically encompasses some of the larger topics that they want you to understand when you're studying the pregnant um, women in healthcare chapter. One, they need to ensure they're performing hand hygiene and following standard precautions. And two, pregnant women are considered healthy um, because for this chapter, you're going to have to know your contraindications. You're going to have to know um, your limitations for vaccines. There's a lot that you're gonna have to know, but specifically for questions that they're gonna ask you. Um, oh, I'm getting a call. I'll call her back. Um, sorry, I got distracted. Um, so let me get it together. So for, for question purposes, you're gonna make sure, you need to make sure that you remember these three things because they're very important. Sorry if you can hear the ringing. Um, okay, next one is key concepts. So, the exposure of non-immunized pregnant healthcare personnel to varicella zoster virus represents a primary risk to the mother and fetus neonate. All right, so let's get the pen out. I'm gonna tell you right now, you have to know this. You have to know your varicella zoster virus. There are lots of different diseases that are going to come up over and over and over again. Hepatitis, varicella, tuberculosis, um, all of these will come up over and over and over again on your test. So you need to make sure that you review them. And it's all aspects of it, uh, all aspects of the disease. You need to make sure you know them. But specifically for your pregnant healthcare personnel, you need to ensure you read up on varicella zoster virus. Um, restricting pregnant women from caring for patients with potentially transmissible infections is considered only for patients infected with parvovirus and for patients with respiratory syncytial virus infections who are receiving ribavirin aerosol. All right, pregnant healthcare personnel and vaccines. Healthcare personnel should be immunized against vaccine preventable diseases before conception. Once pregnancy occurs, most misimmunizations may still be provided, but should occur only after consultation with the healthcare personnel's obstetrici obstetrician. <laughs> the influenza vaccine is recommended for routine administration for routine administration to pregnant women at any trimester if they will be pregnant during the influenza season, including the first trimester. Live virus vaccines are not recommended during pregnancy. This is so important. Um, 
so one of the, the big things that you need to make sure you're paying attention to is your live attenuated viruses and inactivated vaccines. You need to know which ones are live attenuated, which ones are inactivated, because there will be, um, there will be issues when it comes to live attenuated vaccines, because we don't have enough data to say that they're safe. And we'll dive more into that. But all of these are concepts that you need to have a really good understanding of um, before you sit down to take your test. So inadvertent administration of live attenuated virus vaccines, such as rubella, rubiola, varicella, um, smallpox, has not been associated with adverse outcomes as tracked in national registries. But as I previously said, we don't have enough data to say they're safe. All right, some basic principles. Um, sorry, am I going too fast? Hopefully I'm not going too fast. We have so many slides to go through. Um, but patients who may be shedding certain infectious agents may cause the pregnant healthcare personnel to be concerned regarding her safety and the safety of her fetus. These may include patients with cytomegalovirus, parvovirus B19, herpes, herpes simplex virus, syphilis, rubiola, rubella, varicella. Although respiratory syncytial virus infection does not have an adverse effect on the pregnant woman, exposure to the, rib to the ribavirin aerosol used for treatment of RSV is contraindicated during pregnancy based on theoretical but unproven adverse effects during pregnancy. This is another word that they like to use a lot when it comes to our pregnant healthcare workers, contraindicated. That's another one you're going to have to pay attention to, contraindications. So our pregnant healthcare workers, a lot of the times, will require extra support and education um, because they're very protective of their, um, you know, of their baby. They want to make sure that whatever they're doing is the best and safest thing for them, right, as a mom. And a lot of the times you have to just take that extra time to discuss transmission with them and to help them understand why you're giving a certain recommendation or why that staff member isn't getting reassigned to another patient. Um, and I, I really want to emphasize the importance of ensuring um, compassion when you are talking to pregnant healthcare personnel because they do have a tendency um, to to just have a lot of questions you and you want to make sure that you're providing them with appropriate information and information that's relevant to them and that at the heart of your recommendations you um, come from a place of empathy and compassion right because i know sometimes we're kind of like you know we're seen as the the people who aren't particularly listening to to our healthcare staff but we want to um we want to make sure that we do that so infectious agents of concern to pregnant healthcare personnel. So this chart, table 104-1, goes over infectious agents of concern to healthcare, um, to pregnant healthcare personnel according to risk of transmission associated with delivery of healthcare and available preventative measures. So what you have to pay attention to is the top of the chart is the top of the chart. So healthcare associated acquisition possible and prevented by pre-exposure vaccine. So this is going over um, things that, uh, diseases that you can um, essentially come at from a pre-exposure, pre-exposure vaccine. So we have this entire list here. We have um, anthrax, hepatitis A virus, hepatitis B virus, influenza, Neisseria meningitidis, pertussis, rubella, rubiola, varicella, tetanus, diphtheria, and smallpox. Um, for healthcare associated acquisition is unlikely, um, we have human um, herpes simplex virus and toxoplasmosis. This next one is going to be infection prevention precautions are the only preventative measures. So let's go through these different ones. Um, what type of isolation precautions would you use for cytomegalovirus?
Okay, perfect. So I got a lot of standards. Um, so it's okay to guess, right? If you're unsure, just go ahead and take a guess. I still want to, I still want to see what people think. Okay, for the next one, HCV. HCV. And yes, so you put your answers into the questions box. I know that seems odd, but <laughs> yes, that's where you put them. Okay, very good. We have a lot of standard. Perfect. Next one. Parvovirus B19. What type of isolation precautions do we use for parvovirus? Okay. Ooh. <laughs> All right. Okay. So we have standard, droplet, and contact selected. The parvovirus is going to be droplet. And then lastly, tuberculosis. We know that's airborne, right? Um, and then post exposure chemoprophylaxis, um, whether, it, sorry, this is when post exposure chemoprophylaxis is effective. It's going to be HIV, Neisseria meningitidis, and syphilis. So, in essence, the majority of the questions that you are going to be asked on this section are all on this chart right here. Like they're all on this chart. So I would recommend, highly recommend, that you review this chart. And I know it just seems like, oh, I have all of these diseases and there's all of these different type of isolation that I need to know. But yeah, like that's that's the way it is on the test. I, I know I tell you guys this all the time, but you will not have access to Appendix A from CDC when you're taking this test. So you have to know this information. So vaccines for pregnant healthcare personnel. Pregnant healthcare personnel should have, should have been immunized according to the schedule for adult immunization. Immunizations should include the MMR, measles, mumps, rubella, poliomyelitis, varicella, tetanus, diphtheria, or there should be a reliable history of having had the disease before becoming pregnant. We also have the opportunity. Um, we also have the opportunity of um, checking titers as well. That's that's another avenue that you can go. All right. So no evidence exists for risk from vaccinating pregnant women with inactivated vaccines or toxoids. So once again, we have two words that you need to be comfortable with and familiarized before you take this test when it comes to occupational health and pregnant healthcare personnel. Live attenuated and inactivated. There's a distinct difference between the two. And there's one of them that you cannot administer to pregnant women. Which one is it? Live attenuated or inactivated? I'm like a broken record. <laughs> Listen, it's repetition. I just have to repeat it. And then when you're taking the test, you're going to be like, she said life attenuated 72 times in an hour. I remember this. Okay. Vaccination of, of pregnant healthcare personnel. So this is really um, looking at your different infectious diseases, sorry, your vaccines that are available and then your general recommendations for use in pregnant women. So hepatitis A recommended if otherwise indicated. B recommended in some circumstances. Um, HPV, not recommended. Influenza, inactivated. Yes, we can give that. It is inactivated. Influenza live attenuated. That is a no to the no, 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 no. We are not going to be doing that. Um, you have your meningococcal conjugate which may be used if otherwise indicated. Uh, pneumococcal conjugate, inadequate data for specific recommendation. Pneumo pneumococcal polysaccharide, inadequate data. Polio may be used if needed. Again, again, inactivated, right? IPV, IPV, inactivated polio vaccine. So who, who is responsible for inactivated polio vaccine? What is the last name? It's 
Salk. Very good. Oh, I I got a Salk and I got a Saban. So, so you guys are right with Salk. What about Saban? What was he responsible for? Which one was he responsible for? Live attenuated, good. And what are the what's the abbreviation for the for that one? Not sure. Okay. So we have IPV and then we have OPV. Okay. Okay. That's okay, guys. That's okay. We'll, well, I'll touch on the polio vaccine in like two seconds. Then we have tetanus and diphtheria, um, which should be used if otherwise indicated. Uh, the Tdap, which is your with your acellular pertussis, which is recommended. And then you have varicella and saucer, which obviously contraindicated live attenuated virus. Oral polio vaccine. I should have known. Yes. Okay. Let's. We're going to take a quick detour because. I don't know how many of you have gone down this road, but there is some tea, there is some shade, there is some drama that occurred with the oral polio vaccine. Um, the history of the um, polio vaccine is, okay, it's a whole situation. I'm talking like, we could do, we could do like a whole telenovela, like just based on the, what happened with polio vaccine. So inactivated polio virus vaccine was licensed in 1955 and was used extensively from that time until the early 1960s. In 1961, type one and two monoval monovalent oral polio uh, virus vaccine was licensed. And in 1962, type three MOPV was licensed. In 1963, trivalent OPV was licensed and largely replaced IPV use. Trivalent OPV was the vaccine of choice in the United States and most other countries of the world after its introduction in 1963. An enhanced potency IPV was licensed in November 1987 and first became available in 1988. Use of OPV was discontinued in the United States in the 2000s. Okay, so why did we discontinue the use of OPV? Why did we discontinue the use of OPV? Okay, so I'm getting different answers. Eradicated polio because it caused some infection. Okay, I see where you're going with this. Um, so, the his okay, wait, I can't go into the history of the polio vaccine um, because we don't have enough time, but let me tell you, the drama, the tea was piping hot. One of the things that happened with the oral polio vaccine was that it had the ability to essentially revert to um, to a virus that could cause that could cause um, infection that could essentially cause polio, um, and there was some sort of change that happened um, while it was within the gut. So it came, it, it basically, it was administered, right? When it, when you got the oral polio vaccine, you, it was administered um, and it was live attenuated and it didn't cause any harm. But by the time it made all, its way through the human body, through the intestines and came out, it was once again um, infectious. So there was actually a scientist I'm trying to remember what his name. It started with a K. I can't remember his his first name, but he um, actually was the very first one that worked on an oral um, polio vaccine. And one of the one of the sayings um, that came out of that study was, "In like a lamb, out like a lion." So it was going in nice and docile, but coming out with the ability to cause disease. Now. There is a lot of issues. There was, there was. Listen, the court, the correspondence between Salk and Sabin. The okay, scientific drama is on another level. I'm telling you, there's days when I'm like, lose your your petty, but then there are days when I'm like, but I am not, 
as petty as some scientists out there. So um, I highly, highly recommend that you guys go out and learn about this stuff because um, if I had more time, I would go into it because it is too much. But um, you just have to remember that with the oral polio vaccine, we did see some issues with it reverting back. Um, and that's why we no longer use um, the live attenuated vaccine in the United States. Uh, because it, it, it did cause polio. There was also a huge issue when we were first trying to implement um, the polio vaccine. There was, it's called the Cutter incident, um, which relates to vaccine production um, and where it was actually a good number of people were affected um, due to issues with uh, vaccine production. And we caused um, the, um, cases of poliomyelitis in healthy children that were infected with the live virus. So there's a lot there. There are There is a lot there um, that we can't dive into. You know what, maybe someday I'll just, we'll just pick a day and we'll just talk about polio, you know, sit around the campfire and go through it because the tea, the shade, the drama, it was, I mean, it's just, it's a lot. It, it's, I don't know. It's great. It's great. I learned about it in graduate school, um, and I've never, I've never forgotten it because it was so fantastic. Okay, so let's move on. Let's move on. Let me get off the, my polio situation here. Let's move on to cytomegalovirus. Okay, so most people have been infected with cytomegalovirus, but do not have symptoms. If a pregnant woman is infected with cytomegalovirus, she can pass it to her developing baby. This is called congenital CMV and it can cause birth defects and other health problems. No vaccine is available for CMV and consistent adherence to standard precautions is the only preventative measure. It's recognized as the most frequent congenitally and perinatally acquired viral disease known in humans, and it is the single most um, important infectious cause of mental retardation and congenital deafness in the United States. So when you read this, um, if you were reading this and you're a pregnant woman, you're obviously going to be concerned um, if you're having to take care of a patient with cytomegalovirus. But it's important to know that a large number of the population have already been infected with it. So if a nurse is asking for a rearrangement, right, for a reassignment of a patient, we cannot guarantee that that person that nurse is going to be reassigned to doesn't have cytomegalovirus. So once again, from our key facts, we have to emphasize the importance of standard precautions and hand hygiene when it comes to this. This is what's going to ensure that our staff stays safe. Now, down here you see help children with congenital CMV get the care they need, regular hearing checks, routine vision screenings, and developmental milestone checks. So when I actually worked with the health department um, as a health educator, one of the things that I did was volunteer um, to administer hearing uh, tests and uh, vision screenings with the health department that we provided to the schools. Um, so I know that this is something that public health is involved with. And um, yeah, I just wanted to quickly touch on that. Let's keep going with our cytomegalovirus transmission. So CMV is transmitted most frequently by sexual contact or by direct contact with infected urine, saliva, semen, vaginal secretions, or breast milk. Major risks for primary infections among seronegative women include the following. Um, they're younger than 25 years of age, they have multiple sexual partners, and they have exposures to young children, especially those who attend daycare, at home and in the workplace, for example, daycare centers and schools. Um, and we know daycare does have a tendency for there to be a lot of sharing of microbial pathogens. It's like the perfect storm. Because, um, you know, they're just running around having a great time. They don't even know what they're doing and things are getting put in their mouths and they're, you know, high-fiving each other and all the things little children do. And yeah, so it, it is it is a place um, where disease tends to spread quickly. Healthcare personnel do not have an increased risk of acquisition of CMV infection. And that is important. That is really important. The spread of CMV among the general population is facilitated by asymptomatic primary and recurrent infections. Multiple sites of excretion, prolonged and intermittent excretion, and excretion of virus despite the presence of specific immunity. Asymptomatic transmission further supports the need for adherence to standard precautions among all healthcare personnel when in contact with all patients. So what precautions do we use for cytomegalovirus?
standard. Thank you. And if a nurse asks you for a reassignment for a cytomegalovirus patient, do you feel like you can confidently explain to her why that is not recommended? I hope, I hope you do. And remember, we always want to be empathetic and compassionate, but factual. We want to come with the science. It's not just the feelings. Okay, next we're going to talk about hepatitis A virus. So, hepatitis A virus replicates in the liver, is excreted in the bile, and is shed in the stool. You have your peak infectivity, which occurs during the two weeks before um, the onset of jaundice or elevation of hepatic transaminases, when the viral concentration in the stool is greatest. Transmission is primarily from exposure to contaminated feces, but blood can be a source for a short period of time. Maternal HIV transmission to the fetus has not been established. HIV infection during pregnancy can cause an increased risk of severe systemic infections, spontaneous abortion, and preterm delivery. The hepatitis A is an, it is an inactivated vaccine. Now, uh, we recently had a large number of hepatitis A cases, and I, I honestly haven't kept up county-wise what our hepatitis A numbers look like. Um, pretty much, pretty much since COVID came in, um, yeah, pretty much since then. Oh, I, my voice is breaking up. Is that, do I sound okay? Okay. All right. Good. Okay. Hopefully, I sound better now. Um, so we were having a lot of cases, and I haven't kept up with it basically since COVID started, um, but hepatitis A is an inactivated vaccine, and basically when we were experiencing these large number of cases within our community, we moved towards um, contact and enteric precautions for hepatitis A cases within the hospital because we were seeing a lot of transmission within the community. Um, now, I, I don't know if that's the case right now, but um, you just have to kind of keep an eye out for your hepatitis A. I know there were times when we had to do large hep A vaccination events at a community level and also within healthcare because of the number of cases we were having locally. So there's more than just hepatitis A. We have lots of hepatitis out here in the world and hepatitis will be on the test. It will be on the test. I'm gonna tell you right now, it's on the test. Read the chapter know your serology you need to know how to read you need to know your serology and how to read the serology and understand what the serology is telling you so hepatitis b virus hepatitis b virus infection during pregnancy can result in severe disease for the mother fetal loss or chronic infection of the neonate if born alive without post-exposure immunoprophylaxis approximately 40 percent of infants born to hepatitis b virus infected mothers in the united states will develop chronic HBV infection, approximately one-fourth of whom will eventually die from chronic liver disease. So when I was in my global communicable diseases master's in public health, I had um, basically my advisor who was Dr. Isurieta, and one of he did a lot of really good work in Ecuador with hepatitis B. And I distinctly remember him placing such a huge emphasis on um, the administration of your age um, of your age big and your vaccine if a baby is born to a positive mother. Reason being that the sooner a child is infected with hepatitis B, the longer period of time that the virus has to do damage to their liver. So you can see here that in this statement, it's telling you approximately one fourth of whom will eventually die from chronic liver disease, right? So if you're being infected at birth and it's not and you're it's not administered within the recommended 12 hours, that's a longer period of time that you're going to have to live with the virus and more damage that it can cause to your liver. And I I remember his lectures were fantastic. Um he's a fantastic instructor. Um so I'll never forget that. I will never forget that from my classes. And here I have two links down here. Um, and one of them actually does go into um, what you need to do. And it goes, it put it prints out all of the steps that you need to that you need to do if you have a baby that's born to an HBS antigen positive mother. 
and it's right here, administer HBIG and single antigen hepatitis B vaccine at separate injection sites within 12 hours of birth. There's more steps. You have to make sure you notify the health department. We have hepatitis B nurses within the health department um, who are fantastic, and this is what they do. They follow up to ensure babies are, um, are receiving what they need to receive, and it's great. Um, next thing is hepatitis C. So hepatitis C virus may be transmitted sexually by exposure to blood via transfusion, sharing needles for intravenous drug use, percutaneous injury, and rarely perinatal exposure. No vaccine and no effective therapy during pregnancy or the postnatal period exists at the current time. Avoiding percutaneous blood exposure via the use of safety devices and wearing gloves is the best way to prevent occupational exposures. So right here, we have part of those seven key um, portions of standard precautions, which is going to be your PPE and your safety injection practices. I'm not going to write all of, all of it out because you guys know I can't write with this mouse. <laughs> Um, but yes, you have your PPE and your safety injection practices. Studies have shown that acute hepatitis C virus infection in the first and second trimesters causes fetal hepatic injury. All right, let's move on to herpes simplex virus. No vaccine is currently available for herpes simplex virus, and prevention is by adhering again to standard precautions. Healthcare-associated HSV infection is most likely to manifest as herpetic Whitlow, is prevented by the use of gloves for contact with mucous membranes, and is unlikely to affect the general tract or the fetus. Now, how do we transmit herpes simplex virus? Oral-to-oral -oral contact, oral-to-genital contact, and genital-to-genital -genital contact. Next, transmission by fomites contaminated by body fluids has been documented, and humans are the sole natural host for HSV. 55% to 90% of the general population has antibodies to HSV1, HSV2, or both. Now, one important thing to keep in mind is that HSV1 or HSV2 can both be attributed um, to genital herpes, right? So there's a common misconception um, that they can't. Only HSV1 or only HSV2 can infect um, um, the genitals, but both can. Okay, HIV. All right, so risk for transmission. Risk of percutaneous transmission is increased with hollow bore needles and when an increased volume of blood is injected. This is important. Consistent adherence to standard precautions and use of needleless systems and other safety needles will decrease the risk of exposure. Again, we're focusing on our PPE, our hand hygiene, and our safety injection practices. There is a course on Coursera, which I talk about all the time. So, Coursera has free classes and they have this course that's called Infection Prevention in Nursing Homes. They have an entire section on injection safety practices that's set up as a like a game show and it is fantastic. It's very fun to listen to. It's very um, educational. It's interactive. So I highly recommend it. Um, I can't recommend this course enough. I love it. It's one of my favorite infection prevention courses that's that I've ever taken. All right, so let's talk about zero conversion after exposure. So if you have a percutaneous injury, it's about 0.3%, mucous membrane, 0.1%, and non-intact skin is 0.1%. So post-exposure prophylaxis for the pregnant healthcare personnel. If the exposed person is pregnant, the evaluation of risk of infection and need for Post-exposure prophylaxis should be approached as with any other person who has an HIV exposure. There is one difference, however. We can't just go ahead and move forward with that post-exposure prophylaxis. We need to ensure that that mother has the opportunity to discuss the potential benefits and risks with her healthcare provider. She's, you need to ensure that she is able to have a discussion all of those risks and benefits are explained um, before we move forward with any of it, okay?
that is really important to to remember um, because it is it is different right that's a different um, aspect certain drugs should be avoided in pregnant women another reason for involving the pregnant healthcare personnel and healthcare provider and therefore expert consultation for HIV PP is advised for known or suspected pregnancy in the exposed person how am I doing on time? Oh my goodness, I'm not doing that great. I need to get, okay. Human papillomavirus. Um, human papillomavirus vaccines are not recommended for use in pregnant women. If a woman is found to be pregnant after initiating the vaccination series, the remainder of the three dose series should be delayed until completion of pregnancy. HPV, no. You see these little signs where I have it crossed out? That means no, you can't give it to them. It's contraindicated. Don't do it. All right, influenza. Pregnant women are at an increased risk for severe illness from influenza because of physiologic changes during pregnancy. Influenza is transmitted in most instances via respiratory secretions from sneezing and coughing, so droplet. Large droplet transmission within three feet is the primary means of transmission. I, I think that we're going to get a lot more research on droplets distances um it's already being it's already happening now um and i foresee an update to our cdc guidelines in our future the um yeah i foresee it currently the live attenuated influenza vaccine is not recommended again what are we dealing with live attenuated which means no 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 remember we're not going to do that. The Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices recommends routine annual influenza vaccination for all persons aged greater than six months that do not have any contraindications. And we have gone over our difference of inactivated and live attenuated. Um, and you know the difference. So next one, measles, mumps, and rubella, MMR. The MMR vaccine and its component vaccines should not be administered to women known to be pregnant. Because a risk to the fetus from administration of these live virus vaccines cannot be excluded for theoretical reasons, women should be counseled to avoid becoming pregnant for 28 days after vaccinations with measles or mumps vaccines or MMR or other rubella containing vaccines. All right, parvovirus. Um, parvovirus B19 was discovered in 1975 and is the causative agent of erythema infectiosum, also known as fifth disease. This agent is of concern to pregnant healthcare personnel because B, uh, parvovirus B19 can cause infection of fetal red blood cell um, precursors and lead to severe anemia um, and high output cardiac failure in the fetus, high drops fatalis, and fetal death. So a lot of different um, causes of concern. So remember, droplet precautions, the green, we have the green, we have our green droplet precautions. 5% of infections in the first 20 weeks of pregnancy will result in fetal death, often early miscarriages. Respiratory secretions transmit parvovirus B19 during close contact. Patients infected with parvovirus should be placed on droplet precautions. So the viral infection is characterized by a facial rash that resembles a slapped cheek and a reticular pattern of rash on the arms. So that is what we're looking for. Okay, next we're gonna move on to pertussis. Pertussis is an acute respiratory infection caused by Bordetella pertussis. The organism produces multiple toxins that damage respiratory epithelium and can have systematic effects, including the promotion of lymphocytosis. The incubation period for pertussis is seven to, ten, seven to 10 days with the range of five to 21 days. Classic pertussis is characterized by three phases, catarrhal, paroxysmal, and convalescent. Pertussis is transmitted from person to person via large respiratory droplets generated by coughing or sneezing. Infants aged younger than 12 months and especially aged younger than three months are most likely to have severe, severe pertussis, require hospitalization and have respiratory and other complications of pertussis. Mo oh, this is so sad. I don't like reading this um, 
bullet point. Um, most deaths due to pertussis occur in infants less than two months of age. Yes, so yes, that is very sad. Tetanus toxoid, reduced diphtheria toxoid, and acellular pertussis, your Tdap, your acellular, acellular pertussis vaccine is recommended before pregnancy, during pregnancy, or immediately postpartum. Okay, so some of us do better with pictures. So here we have the um, this graphic by CDC that goes over people of all ages who need whooping cough vaccines or pertussis. So you have your DTAP for children. So here you have your schedule for preteens. So from 11 to 12, that's when that is recommended. For pregnant women, so here's our chapter that we're going over during the during the 27th to 36th week of each pregnancy, and then for adults, anytime for those who have never received it. Okay, varicella zoster virus. I don't even know. I don't know what to do, but I, you need to. You got to read this. Like you have to know your varicella. I've said it probably like six times today, and I hope if you have some time this weekend that you read that chapter or you go on the CDC webpage or you watch a lecture. I frankly, I don't have a preference as long as you learn the information. So varicella, chickenpox and herpes zosters are different manifestations of the same virus. The primary infection is chickenpox. When varicella zoster virus first infects humans, VZV remains latent for a variable period of time, and when it is reactivated, it presents as shingles or herpes zoster infection. Because the effects of the varicella virus on the fetus are unknown, pregnant women should not be vaccinated. The infection is highly contagious, 90% transmission rate to susceptible household contacts. Um, from one day before the outbreak of the rash and lasts until the lesions have dried completely. So, things that you need to remember when it comes to varicella zoster. You have two main things. You need to know whether your host is going to be immunocom... Uh, okay, you know what? I can't, I can't write with this thing. Okay, you need to know if the host is either immunocompetent or immunocompromised. That's gonna be the first thing. Is What are we dealing with? Is this patient immunocompetent? Or are they immunocompromised? It's gonna be the first question that you ask. The next question that you're gonna ask is, is this infection localized or is it disseminated? And based on how those two questions are answered, we'll move forward with the appropriate isolation. Right, and then here we have a picture of our dermatomes, and you can see you have all of your fun dermatomes, things that you can look at here, lots of fun stuff. So, varicella zoster virus, chickenpox pneumonia is the most common complication and is expected to occur in 15 to 50 percent of adults when no antiviral treatment is given. Chickenpox pneumonia in pregnancy is more severe than in non pregnant adults with a maternal mortality rate of 41 to 46% compared with 11% in the non-pregnant adult. Treatment with acyclovir is recommended for the pregnant woman who develops chickenpox. Fetal death is the result of severe maternal varicella infection, um, usually accompanied with pneumonia. It has not been shown that the virus causes fetal death or first trimester wastage. So next thing is your varicella zoster immunoglobulin. In December 2012, the FDA approved Verizig, a varicella zoster immunoglobulin preparation for use in the United States for post-exposure prophylaxis of varicella for persons at high risk for severe disease who lack evidence of immunity to varicella and for whom varicella vaccine is contraindicated. Verisig is now approved for administration as soon as possible following varicella zoster virus exposure, ideally within 96 hours. Um, for greatest effectiveness. The CDC recommends the use of Verisig for pregnant women without evidence of immunity. Okay, so we've covered a lot and we have the last couple of minutes to go through our questions. I think that 
I spent too much time talking about polio, so <laughs> I apologize. Okay, so question one. An urban community is experiencing an outbreak of Bordetella pertussis. Several employees have contacted the IP at their healthcare facility for information on the tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis vaccine. They question the need for the vaccine because they received it as a child. The IP should inform them that the Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices recommends that A, all adults aged 19 and older should receive at least one dose of Tdap. B, if the, if the employee is pregnant, she should not receive the vaccine. C, all individuals must receive the vaccine every 10 years. And D, individuals who have had the disease do not need to receive the vaccine. Okay, so we have a lot of different answers. I've gotten like five phone calls during this entire lesson, so I just know something's going down. <laughs> okay, but let's go over this. Now, I want you to pay attention to questions. This question is leading you to the right answer, and there's a lot of distractor answers that you're going to be confused by. The context of the question is, you have an adult coming to you and asking you why they need to get the vaccine if they already got it as a child, right? And that's what you need to answer. You need to answer why, why they need to get the vaccine now as an adult, right? That's what you need to focus on. First, let's get rid of the ones that we know are not applicable. If the employee is pregnant, she should not receive the vaccine. That's not appropriate. Tdap is appropriate for um, pregnant women, acellular pertussis. All individuals must receive the vaccine every 10 years. It's a recommendation, absolutely, but this doesn't answer the question that, that is being asked. So I can see why some of you chose C, but that's not what they're asking you. Individuals who have had the disease do not need to receive the vaccine. That's great. That's fantastic. You have natural immunity. Congratulations. But it doesn't answer the question. It's not answering the question. Since 2005, a single booster dose of Tdap has been recommended for children and adolescents aged 11 to 18 years old and adults aged 19 to 64 years old. That is the recommendation that the Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices recommends. And that's what you're going to tell that person that's asking you why they need to get that vaccine, right? So we did have an update. So use of the tetanus, toxoid, reduced diphtheria, toxoid, and acellular pertussis vaccines, updated recommendations of the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. Keep in mind that this chapter on the APIC website has not been updated since 2014. Um, but we do have an update that was published recently, January 24, 2020. Well, you know what? It's, I guess it's not that recent, but it feels recent because this year is a blur. Um, but yes, so the biggest change that they published is that they're now um, supporting the Tdap as that as that booster dose. So the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices recommendations have been updated to ally either tetanus and diphtheria thox toxoids or Tdap to be used for the decennial TD booster, tetanus prophylaxis for wound management, and for additional required doses in the catch-up immunization schedule if a person has received at least one Tdap dose. What are the implications for public health practice? Allowing either Tdap or TD to be used in situations where TD only was previously recommended increases provider point of care flexibility and access. So perfect. Question two, I'm like trying to sp speed through these. Okay, question two, a pregnant healthcare worker is concerned because she has been assigned to take care of a patient who has cytomegalovirus infection. How should an IP respond to this concern? A, reassign her to another patient. B place the patient on contact precautions while the healthcare worker cares for him. C, advise her that following standard precautions while caring for the patient will prevent transmission. Or D, advise her that she is likely already infected with CMV and should not worry about transmission. 
First of all, there is a disrespectful answer choice on this question that we're just going to go ahead and cross out. Do not do that. Do, do not approach a pregnant healthcare worker with this situation. It's just no. No. Disrespectful. That's rude. We're crossing it out just because it's rude. I went over this this entire lesson. The answer is C. The answer is C. The answer is C. If you did not select C, when I send out the recording, you're going to have to watch it again because this one, I gave you guys this answer like at least three times. Question three, a pregnant environmental services worker who is non, ooh, see, this question right here, this is the kind of stuff that you're going to get asked on the CIC. And this is why I tell you, you need to read the varicella um, chapter and you need to know your contraindications and you need to know your exposures for occupational health. But let me bring myself together. So question three, a pregnant environmental services worker who is non-immune to varicella enters the room of a patient with confirmed varicella before an isolation sign is posted. She spends six minutes in the room with the patient who is not wearing a mask. This exposure happened on January 11th. After giving the employee varicella zoster immunoglobulin, it is determined that she should be excluded from work. What day can she return to work? Okay, so this is the type of question on the test that if you're unsure, I don't want you to get caught in the tangled web. I want you to be methodical, you think through it, you know what you know, and you move on, all right? These questions are the ones that are gonna eat up your time and you cannot afford that right? You know what you know going into the test. There are going to be areas of weakness and areas of strength. If you're unsure, give it your best guess and keep it moving because I guarantee you there are another 15, 20 questions that you do know the answer to. So don't let, you know, little miss question number three, um, you know, get you all, what's the word? Frazzled. Okay, so the healthcare worker was given um, the varicella zoster immunoglobulin. Normal time off would be from day 10 through day 21 after exposure. But because um, the immunoglobulin was given, it is recommended to keep the employee off through day 28. So they are able to return on the 29th day after exposure. Question four, a hospital has admitted an immunocompetent patient with localized herpes zoster. During unit rounds, the IP notes a sign on the door that says, no pregnant women. How should the IP best respond to this? A, leave the sign on the door because the patient poses a high risk of disease transmission to pregnant women. B, remove the sign from the door, but ask the charge nurse to not assign the patient to any pregnant healthcare personnel and to prevent pregnant visitors from entering the room. C, remove the sign from the door and place the patient on both contact and airborne precautions. Or D, remove the sign from the door and ensure that all lesions are completely covered. Standard precautions are sufficient to prevent the spread of the virus.
Okay. So when it comes to varicella zoster, you're going to want to make sure that you answer two questions, right? Is my patient immunocompromised or immunocompetent? And is it localized or disseminated? In this sentence, we have an immunocompetent patient with localized disease. That means standard precautions and that, our, our, and that all of our lesions are covered. That's what we're gonna do. Now, if we were dealing with an immunocompromised patient with disseminated disease, uh, sorry, with disseminated disease, we can't cover it. It's mo over multiple dermatomes. That's going to be your proper isolation, which would be immunocompromised, disseminated disease, airborne in contact. Very good. Okay, and I'm over time. So let's, I think this is the last one. Let me check. Uh, yeah, this is the last one. All right, question five. A patient with a confirmed diagnosis of varicella is seen in a busy emergency department. The staff at the registration desk immediately placed a mask on the patient until he could be moved to a negative airflow room in the ED, where he then removed his mask. A pregnant environmental services employee who is non-immune to varicella enters the room before an isolation sign is posted. She spends six minutes in the room with the patient who is no longer wearing a mask. Which of the following is the most appropriate post-exposure response. All right, okay guys, so I always tell you, you need to cross out. Please, when you're on the test, if you're really lost and you don't know what answer to go to, at minimum, at minimum, you can cross one of them out. What do we know about varicella and live attenuated vaccines? For no reason, all right? Not if it's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Sunday, okay? Will you give it to a pregnant healthcare worker? So. D, give the EVS employee the vaccine? No, no, absolutely we will not. We will not do that. We will not do that today or tomorrow. We cannot give it to them. So you already know D is out the window. Goodbye, see you never again. Um, have the employee wear a mask from day 10 through 21 after the exposure and watch for signs and symptoms of disease. You know what, if you're feeling bold, sure, leave that one on there, but that's not it. B, administer the varicella vaccine immediately and place the employee off work from day 10 through day 21. Again, live attenuated vaccine, automatically, automatically you get rid of B and D. B and D are out, like from the start, from the jump, we are Xing them out. So you should be left with A and C. And the only appropriate answer is A, give the EVS employee the varicella zoster immunoglobulin and place off work from day 10 through 28. Okay, guys, I've literally gotten like five calls. Something's happening. So I'm going to go ahead and get off. Thank you so much for today. I will see you next week. Next week is going to be fabulous. We're going to have another really fantastic, fun time. Um, you know, it is what it is. Happy Friday. Have a good weekend fill out your surveys, um, and listen to some podcasts, you know, get your education on. Um, the thing I love the most about my job is that I learn new things all the time, um, and you should be learning all the time. All right, so thank you, and um, have a good weekend. Goodbye.